We're waiting for the last few to get settled, maybe. And maybe some others come in yet. Uh, good evening, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Albert Gunning, and I'm a bless I am an elder here at, uh, at Blessings. And on behalf of the consistory, I extend a welcome to, to all of you, especially to guests and visitors that among us, and also those who follow us uh, via live stream. If you would like more information about blessings, about Christianity, or about Jesus, then you, can, you have a, a number of options. You can talk to the ushers, members who wear the blue usher lanyards. Also, Pastor Conan will be available to talk to you after the service as well. Another option you have for guests and visitors, they can in, send an email to info at blessingshamilton.ca and someone will get back to you in the next few days. Finally, there are visitor information cards in the chair pockets in the pew. Complete the info and hand it to me or to one of the ushers and then someone will contact you in the week that lies ahead. Then there are male and female prayer team members. They will be here at the Purple Banner following the service. And they will pray with you. If, if you have a burden on your heart or if you have experienced God's blessing in a special way. You can also submit matters for prayer to prayer-team at, at blessingshamilton.ca and members of the prayer team will pray for you or will contact you if you indicate that on the email. And of course, I extend a special welcome to Pastor Conan Kublik. He is the lead pastor of New City Church in downtown uh, Hamilton. Pastor Conan, we are grateful for your willingness you know, to preach the gospel this evening, and we pray that the Spirit will guide you as you do so. Then I would request you to rise for the call uh, to worship. We will give thanks to you, O Lord, with our whole heart. We will recount all of your wonderful deeds. Our opening song is Be Thou My Vision.
As we enter into the Lord's presence, let us lift up our hearts. We have an expression that's called, with the church of all times and places. And it's often used to introduce reciting or singing the Apostles' Creed. It's an important phrase because it expresses that the Apostles' Creed has been used since the early Christian church of all times and also of all places all over the world. It is a concise summary of faith and it unites Christians all over the world. And this evening we sing our profession of faith with him too. Let us pray together. Lord God, let the words of your servant's mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and redeemer. Lead us in your truth and teach us, for you are the God of our salvation. For you we wait all day long, 
Through Christ our Lord and Savior. Amen. Our confessional reading this evening is from the uh, Heidelberg Catechism, question answer 43. And I will read the question and I'll ask you to uh, read the answer together. The question is, what further benefit do we receive from Christ's sacrifice and death on the cross? Through Christ's death. So that the evil desires of the flesh may no longer reign us, but that we may offer ourselves to him as a sacrifice of thankfulness. Good evening, everyone. It's always a privilege to be here with oh, all of you. Uh, today's scripture reading is from Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, if you've got a Bible or a Bible app, I do encourage you uh, to follow along with me. Ephesians 4, verses 17 to 24. So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their thinking. They're darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they're full of greed. That, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught, with regard to your former way of life, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God, in true righteousness and holiness. This is the word of the Lord. This passage is about something new coming into our lives. Paul is using here uh, an illustration that was common in his day, and it works well in ours as well. Really, he's kind of using a, a fashion illustration. He wants you to put off something and put on something new. That we're saying here in this thing is, in a sense, this has already happened to you. The old self has been put off. It's died when Christ took our sin. And our new self is being put on for us as well when Christ rose and we are in him now. That's the thrust of the passage here. In uh, our social media day, there's been the rise, and I think even if you're not this type of person, there's the rise of the fashion influencer. I know, guys, you're big into this. You don't have to wait. Just wink, wink, nudge, nudge. I get it. Yeah. But the fashion influencer has been, you know, someone there is going, this is what's really in style. It's no longer just the domain of the designer. But the fashion designer uh, tells you about how to project the image about who you really are. If this is who you are, your clothes and all of that should kind of go along with who you are. Paul is saying something similar. Though far deeper, it's not merely a superficial thing that he's saying here about our outside and what we wear on the outside, but he's saying this is something that has happened so deep in your life that your lifestyle should follow. Now he uses here, you should no longer live as the Gentiles do. Now he's not picking on Gentiles. In that day and age, uh, if you weren't a Jew, in the Jewish mind you were a Gentile. It was them and everyone else. He's not picking on them per se, but what he's saying is here is to a church that was predominantly Gentile converts, he's saying your lifestyle, because of what's happened to you in Jesus, should no longer look like your old cultural lifestyle and assumptions. Something so profound, so deep has happened in your life that your life should look completely different from the inside out. All of that should line up. You should project the image about who you really are and what has happened to you. If you've ever watched the show, and I'm not sure if it's even still on, but uh, what not to wear. 
probably seen it or at least know of it. But here you would get people who had in crazy clothing and clothing choices and wardrobe choices. And they would be put into the hands of two fashion experts. And I always would love because they would go through the wardrobe and, you know, at least one of them would kind of delicately hold out some of those things and kind of screw up their nose and go, this is really offensive almost, and drop it into the garbage. Paul is actually kind of doing that here. He's saying your old lifestyle, because you are a new self, a new person in Jesus, that old lifestyle is offensive to your new way of being, living in Jesus. It belongs over here. And you've put on a new self because of what God has done in your life. There's a makeover that's happened in you. Well, let's look at first why the makeover. Look at verses 17 to 19 here. There's something wrong with the old you. This is not unique to any one of us. This is something that is true of every human being, uh, period. Something is wrong with us. I think this idea of sin and something deeply wrong with humans is something that's becoming more and more challenging in our culture. Even many Christians that I know think that people are just basically good. And it's true, God created us in amazing ways. He created us to be able to to dream and plan and reason and create and invent and all kinds of things. But the Bible tells us that since the fall, since humanity rejected God and his rule in our lives, something fundamentally is broken in every single one of us. And Paul describes some of these things here of what that has done to us. If you look at these verses, he is saying here, we're confused in our thinking. It's futile is how some of the translations put it. It has no purpose. We are kind of drifting on the sea of life. We have, are greedy and twisted in our desires. We're darkened in our understanding. Sin has uh, twisted something deep in our souls, and we are so impacted by this sin And it's actually led us to being alienated from God. A deep separation here. And our arrogance and greed, it's not even just a a mental mind issue. The, The way that we think, it works itself out into the choices that we make in our daily lives. Our actions, Paul tells us here, are in many ways arrogant, greedy, We tend towards things that are dirty and impure because our souls are self-centered in the way that we live and think and act, and there's always a greed for more. Sin is deceptive, he's telling us, because we often chase these things down the road, but he's saying, look, this is not satisfying here. Life apart from God, he's describing here, is dark, it's blind, There's a stubborn refusal to walk in the truth he is telling us here. And there's a jarring clash if you are a Christian now, he's saying, if you just continue on as if nothing has changed in your life because something deep has happened here. He's saying every human being needs a makeover in their soul. My wife and I, she grew up on a farm. My grandparents owned a ranch in southern Saskatchewan. We both grew up around animals and uh, the farm. And if you've ever grown up around the farm, and I'm sure some of you did in some form or another or been there, uh, if you ever did chores, there were special clothes for that task. And as soon as you got in the house, you got rid of those clothes, you got cleaned off, showered. If you had the money, you just put them in the burn bin because usually it was so offensive and they smell. And even after they were washed, often you're like, it it never actually comes out fully. You needed to take it off. Something had to be radically done to fully change there. But you would come out of the shower looking and smelling clean like a whole new person. But can you imagine then going, you know what? I really, really liked those socks. Maybe just put on the undershirt. Everything else we'll put on new. What would that do? It would contaminate the whole outfit. 
You may as well not have showered, not have cleaned up. That didn't, it wouldn't fit. The effect would be jarring to our lives because you're bringing the old into the new. Paul, in a far more substantive way, is saying that is what happens when we are converted and yet we don't change. We actually need a makeover. And it's not just that we need to come to Christ and be forgiven, but it needs to be worked out in every part of our life. This makeover is necessary, and a partial makeover will not do. So how the makeover then? Verses 20 to 24 describe taking off the olds and putting on the new. It's a picture of conversion. When Jesus comes into our life and we hear about him, we see sin for what it is. We see this deceptive nature. We see the darkening that goes on in our souls, the things that it's twisted and distorted, and we come to have an ever-deepening realization of that as we learn about Christ, Paul tells us. It's interesting the way he describes this, verse 20, you learned Christ, you heard him, you were taught in him. And he assumes that they learned about him because he planted this church. So he's like, I I know you heard about this because this is the gospel that was preached. It was about Jesus and him crucified and him risen. And what happens when we hear about Christ, when we hear the good news about him, we see life and truth for what it really is. And our eyes and our understanding begin to be opened up and we see a whole new way of life in him. And when we come to faith in him, Paul is saying the old life, the old self, in fact, has been done away with and a new self has been put on you. A complete transformation, a complete makeover in our soul. It's new creation, to use other language from other parts of the New Testament here. God bringing in the new self. After our little cold snap this week, and now it warming up a little bit, I don't know about you, but I kind of get an itch for spring already. I know know we're a long ways from there still somewhat, but I get an itch for spring. I get an itch for that time where you're like, I'm confident that it's warm enough that I'm ditching the winter clothes and just going with shorts. Shorts and t-shirts, this is the good life. The old is gone, the new is here. Why? Because those, those old clothes don't actually fit in spring. They're, they're constricting. They don't work in that type of thing. That was not what they were for. They're heavy. They're bulky. They're not appropriate. Paul is saying here, something far more significant than spring has happened in your life. This new life in Jesus has caused you to be made new, a new self, and it depends on what God has done for you. It's not us willing ourselves to change, wishful thinking, because go back to verses 17 to 19. On your own, you run away from God. You're darkened in your understanding. Your thinking's futile. You go in a different direction altogether. It's like when I had toddlers and they made a mess. Your your kids are probably much more golden than mine were at, at that age, but many of them, after making the mess, I would come in or my wife would come in and go, okay, we're gonna clean up. You go over here, you play with your toys, we're gonna clean up, and often what would happen was a little stomping. No, I fix it. You ever you ever let them try to fix it? <laughs> that mess just got deeper and wider and higher. That's what it's like when we try to fix ourselves. If we actually do it without conversion, if Christ is not made us new, put off an old life, put off the old self, the mess that we make trying to fix ourselves is astounding. So God converts us. He reorders our lives. Jesus begins to heal us in our minds, helps us to think and understand the truth that is in him, beginning to get a clearer picture of reality. Because that's what truth is. That's what the gospel does. It's not just some spiritual thing that happens over here in your life, and here's the rest of life. It's a picture of true reality that is now permeating every aspect of your soul, your life, your walk, your daily decisions. 
We need to be converted. We need a makeover of the soul. We need God to come in and take us, as he says two chapters earlier, from death to life, to put off the old self, and he puts on the new self for us. And he invests himself all in. Jesus takes our place. The one spotless soul, the one true human who lives the one perfect life, comes and he puts and takes on himself at the cross our filthy rags. And our filthy rags are not just the bad things that we do. You know what the Bible in the Old Testament describes the best things that we do apart from God? Filthy rags. Jesus takes the worst of us and the best of us apart from God, and at the cross, he takes it upon himself and recognizes, just like at the farm where you want to burn the old clothes, those things need to be destroyed, taken all the way down, and in his death, it's buried and done away with. Because sin is not just dirty, it is corrupting, it's deceitful, it's evil, it must be permanently removed, and only God can do this. And then he begins a work in our souls by the Holy Spirit to continually help us begin a new way of thinking and acting and living because the old often wants to sneak in. But he raises us to new life in Jesus and gives us his true righteousness and holiness. Tells us in these verses we're being made to look like God himself in true righteousness and holiness. An incredible Incredible gift. Right at the moment, for the last couple of weeks, um, there have been uh, award shows, and these are ongoing. And often when we look at these musicians and actors and actresses on the, the red carpet and we see their pictures, we see them in these really expensive, beautiful gowns and suits and ties and go, that's incredible. But here's the interesting little secret. Most of them did not buy those. They did not provide their own clothes. The designer gave them the best to showcase his creativity. In a far greater way, God puts his righteousness on us, the robes and right standing of Jesus, his flawless, spotless life, and his record comes and is placed on us as a display of the glory and creativity and redemption and forgiveness and grace and love of God so that we look beautiful and he gets the glory. You have the righteousness of Jesus to show what God is like. Finally, in this passage, we see in verse 24 this. It tells us to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. We actually have a model. It's not merely that you needed a makeover, and a makeover has happened, and now you're kind of left to fend for yourself as, what now do I do with life? We're about to see a coronation of the, the new king, King Charles. There's an interesting thing here, is if you're invited to that coronation, there is a style guide that will be provided to you, because not any clothes will do. What is acceptable is laid out for you. And in Ephesians, in the verses that follow, we are not going to cover them tonight, but take a look, because using this language of putting off and putting on, he is showing us concrete examples, allowing us to see a model of this is what it looks like now, given the reality of the new self. Here's some concrete examples of what the new life in Jesus looks like. Just like as a model walks down that runway saying, this is what it looks like when the new clothes are put on. This, this is what the new fashion is, and not just now, but this is what's coming. Jesus himself is our model, the likeness of God because he has done away with the old self and given us the new self. The image of God is being restored in us so that more and more we can look like God in true righteousness and holiness. Again, 
something that he provides for us. And therefore, we're beginning to get, get the power from the Spirit as he begins to work in our lives so that our outward self, our outward decisions, our outward deeds begin to match the reality that has happened from the inside out. New decisions, new lifestyle, new choices, new attitudes, new priorities here, which makes us begin to ask the question, where are we looking for our models? Because a, the believer's lifestyle should match the new self, that old self that's already dead, the new self is here. We need to learn to live into this reality. Where are we looking for our models? As I thought about this passage and its application to me and to my family, I thought that, you know what, really one of the things we need to press into and ask ourselves is are the models that we give our time and attention and prioritize in our life are the things that will shape us the things that will show us how to live, shape our priorities in the way that we think. That means if we're giving and prioritizing three hours on TikTok or Netflix or a movie or sports or something else and giving three, five, ten minutes to Scripture, which one do you realistically think is actually the model that is shaping you, that is showing you how to live? We're going to put on the new self, this new reality, and have it worked out completely in our lives. It calls us to some new priorities, to prioritize Scripture, to prioritize prayer, to prioritize your Christian community and your church and your small group and your youth group, times of family worship, placing before us day after day the model. This is what it looks like. You, you want to see what God looks like? Here's where you're going to encounter it. You want to hear about it? You want to learn Christ, hear Christ? You're going to hear it proclaimed from this pulpit and from other pulpits of faithful churches so that you learn Christ and you discover in Him that you have been created. The old self is gone. The new self is being put on by God, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Let's pray. Lord, this is uh, something that challenges us because it reminds us that we actually are far more flawed and faulty than we thought, that we actually need you to come into our lives, you the grand creator, designer, to make us new, to do what we cannot do for ourselves. Thank you that you have done this in Jesus. Lord, now for those of us whose faith is in him, would you help us to live lives that are consistent with this new self? And for those who are here who have not yet encountered you, may they come into this church and learn Christ, hear Christ, encounter him in a real deep way so that they see what he has given to them and may they accept it for themselves. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
So we've got uh, a few questions here. Uh, the first is this, is putting off the old self, putting on the new self, something that is a one-time event in our life? Example, conversion, or is it a daily occurrence? That's a great question. Um, what Paul here, in, in this passage, and then if there's a parallel passage in Colossians, there's some stuff that's related in Romans, it is both. It is a one-time event. The old self has died, the new self has been made new as God brings us from death to life. As our faith is put in Jesus, we see him uh, for who he is. So that is conversion. That is a thing that's happened to the Christian already. That's in the past. It's established. It's a fact. Now, then there's, there's this sanctification process that then works itself out. Um, as we now learn and grow, as our minds are renewed, to begin to see those old clothes for what they are, that they actually weren't as beautiful as they thought. They didn't actually fit as well as we thought. Uh, have you ever um, looked at your old pictures now? If you're, if you're under 20 year, don't, don't do this yet. You, you, don't, you don't know what this is. But if you go back and look at your junior high picture or something, you're just like, what was I thinking? That's what you begins to happen in the life of the Christian over time. As our minds are made new, this once and for all thing that's happened in our life as we grow in our understanding of the beauty of Christ and see the reality of sin, we have a new desire and a new perspective, which leads us then to day by day, there's an ongoing conversion in a sense, this ongoing sanctification of going, you know what, this aspect of my life does not belong, and it's leads us to confession. It, it leads us to repentance. It leads us to ask the Spirit to work deep in our lives. That's this putting off and putting on. So it's already happened. The, the deep work has already happened. Now we continue to be, have this worked out in our lives. And again, that's why I pointed you to the next set of verses. He's giving us concrete examples here. Conversions happened in their lives. But he's saying in light of that, Let's begin to have lives and lifestyles and attitudes and relationships that reflect the fact that you have been converted. The old self is gone, the new self is here. Does that help? Hmm. What do I do if the old clothes seem, seem to stay on? Yep, that's exactly what happens, is there's a sense, and this is the thing, the reality that Paul then pushes on, uh, and why he pushes on it, is he's saying, look, the old self, is, this definitive thing has happened, but now this thing must change. You must learn to grow into the new reality. And every one of us falls down in this area, and the ongoing grace of God begins to work itself out in our lives. This is, again, where repentance comes in, this ongoing seeing sin for what it is, seeing the old lifestyle for what it is, and going, you know what, God, you need to stir and work something in me and give me a new heart and attitude uh, to, to see this new attitude for us. I mean, some of the things he talks about in the next section is like put off anger, this kind of anger that's boils and simmers and leads to bitterness. He talks about uh, speaking truth. I mean, some of these things that are very basic in our, in our lives, he's going to push in and say, look, these sorts of things need to be dealt with in a deep way. And here's my experience. When I think that God has pushed this and dealt with this in my life in an area and I'm like, wow, man, I've repented of it all the way down. This is, this is great. I've got new attitudes and things. And you know what happens over time? My wife comes to me or one of my good friends. They're like, Conan, just making some observations here about some attitudes and, and life here. There's some, some deeper soul work that needs to happen so that you look more like God in true righteousness and holiness. It's an ongoing work. We don't arrive this side of glory, this side of Jesus' return, but he is always at work. If you've got other questions, I'd love to interact with you after, but um, we'll leave it there for now.
Is the benediction is the thing? No. It is time for the uh, offertory, and the deacons have a special cause for the month. That's word indeed. More info will be uh, shown on the slides. Uh, you can give electronically uh, using deacons at blessingshamilton.ca and indicate if uh, your donation is for the deacons yeah, or for word and deed or a certain amount for both. It's your choice. There's also a uh, collection box located uh, on the back wall of the sanctuary for those who would prefer to donate via cash or check. And guests are welcome to participate, but not required. We are thankful that you decided to worship with us. And consider this verse as you give. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. We have an approximate one-minute musical interlude for the offering. Please rise for our closing prayer. And after the prayer, Pastor Connor will give us the benediction and then we'll sing our closing song. As our prayer, our closing prayer, I have uh, selected a prayer that is based on uh, Psalm 146. Let's pray together. Praise the Lord. Our soul praises you, O Lord. We will sing praises to you, to you as long as we live. We will not put our trust in our government or in influential people, for when they die, the influence and power are gone. We are blessed because we hope and trust in you, O God, who created the world and everything in it. You were a faithful God to our spiritual fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and you remain unchanging and faithful to us in this century and on to the end of time. You uphold those of us who are weighed down with the cares of this world, and you feed those who are hungry with the bread of life. You set prisoners free with the assurance that their sins are forgiven and that you and that you are in control of the events of their lives. You give sight of understanding to those who are blind in their sin. You lift up those who are bowed down, and you love those who are righteous. You watch over us, aliens in a sinful world, and you are a father to the orphaned and a comforter to the widowed. You do not allow the plans of the wicked to flourish or to come to completion. You will reign forever and for all generations. Praise the Lord. Amen. Receive this blessing from God, and I chose it from Jude, verses 24 and 25, as it's fitting. 
Now to him who is able to protect you from stumbling and make you stand in the presence of his glory without blemish and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory and majesty and power and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen.